In this episode, we're talking about how you can build better connections with potential clients so that their journey to actually working with you runs so smoothly that they stick around for a long time. Welcome to JFDI with the two Lauras. This is the podcast for freelance social media marketers, where we share tips, advice, and opinions on business and marketing. We've worked in this industry for so long and dealt with so many potential clients that we've lost count. So we have a lot of nuggets we can't wait to share with you in this episode. And we're also going to give you a simple tip that you can implement today to stop you from wasting time with people that can't afford your fees. So keep listening for that little nugget. Okay, so let's start with why this is actually so important. Because the, the better connection you've got with someone, the more likely it is that they're essentially going to want to work with you. They're going to want to hire you, put money in your bank. <laughs> they're likely to say yes to that proposal. And obviously, if they've got that better connection with you, then they're likely to keep you long term. And they're going to likely to recommend you to other people and always remember you when someone needs that social media expert your name is going to be on the tip of their tongue so I think it goes therefore without saying that building good connections with these potential clients and then clients is paramount to good business yeah and I think on those points you made two really good points there one of them was that they will stick with you for a long term. And that's the dream, isn't it? Mm. Having a client who you onboard who stays with you for a long time is way better for your business than having short-term clients here and there that you have to keep replacing. You have to keep learning about a new business and building those new relationships. Long-term clients are the way forward, 100%. Yeah, and I think long-term clients and a good connection with a long-term client can't... It's, it's not possible with everybody, is it? Like no. I've had clients where I probably should have worked harder to understand whether we were going to build that connection. <laughs> and actually there were probably red flags in those early days that I should have probably listened to because it doesn't matter how great the project is or how brilliant the brand is. If you don't have those good connections with the people that you are dealing with and the people who pay your bills, it can make it really just difficult not particularly yeah. enjoyable job and that's the whole reason we're freelancers isn't it because we want to enjoy our job otherwise we could just go and work for any old tom dick and harry and just get paid a salary yeah. but the other thing you said just then was you said that when you build that relationship with people they will remember you and they will recommend you i think it's really important to say that even if they don't work with you if you've built a relationship with people who are following you with people who you were having conversations with maybe in dms or even like in that pre-qualifying kind of stage even if they don't end up working with you spending money with you if you've built that relationship they're still yeah. going to recommend you because they will still know how awesome you are it's the wife of my current client is a great example of that she followed me she's got her own business she followed me for a long time we used to chat a lot I used to like her business she used to like mine she used to get tips and advice from me but she was never going to outsource her social media but one of the best things she ever did was recommend me to her husband and he's now who's got multiple businesses and I've worked with him now for over four years I think it is and that's just because of she got to like me on social media we used to just chat and it wasn't always just talking social media it was just chit chat in the DMs. She noticed that I like gym, uh, gin. She not the gym. Gym. Definitely, Laura like the definitely gym. does not like the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not confuse those two things. <laughs> Before she... people start asking you if you want to be an influencer for gym wear, no, gin maybe yes. Could you, ima- could you imagine? <laughs> yeah. So you know, it was those. You know, I would put something on my stories about on a Friday night enjoying my glass of gin and she could resonate with that. And we would have those kind of conversations about being business owners. And I think you're so right. This isn't just about being recommended by your current or previous clients. This is just being recommended by people who are in your world that you've impressed in some way. 
and you've got that that connection and going back to what you just said about the gin not the gym this is where it all starts with your messaging isn't it because you need to really understand who it is that you want to work with and how you can build that connection with them but it's also bringing out parts of your personality like the gin so that because maybe you do want to work with gin companies who knows but if you don't you can still talk about gin (laughs) it still brings people into your world but it definitely starts with knowing who is your ideal customer. So you ask, they are the first people you're speaking to and crafting all of your messaging so that it, it not only attracts them, but it makes them want to follow you and it actually makes them want to seek out your content because they know that it's for them and it gets them to pay attention to you. So, for example, if your dream clients were men and you've done your research into your audience personas and all of that stuff and you know that the men who you work with are sports fans and specifically you know that they like football and it's a weekend you've just watched the news they've been talking about a game if you don't if you talk about that in your messaging that's something they're probably going to be wanting you know they're going to resonate with it because they're football fans and if they've seen you talking about football even if you don't particularly like football yourself it's just that link isn't it and it just yeah brings that link in i i do think like where you say you know, even if you don't really like football, I do think there's a grey area. Like, I do think you have to be fairly authentic. Like, if I was to start harping on about football... Yeah, I don't think you want your content to be about, oh, my God, did you watch a match? It was brilliant, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) But you could just have some tie, some marketing segue that links back, you know? (laughs) Yeah. A lot of this is, it's about being like just true to who you are isn't it and being Mm. yourself and putting yourself out there you know there's too many of us who will hide behind the canva graphics and not really you know yes they're giving brilliant advice but it's all quite flat because you don't know the personality of the person it's more it's quite robotic there's not much um authenticity about it I hate that word I've used it about three times already but (laughs) but it's so true isn't it it's about being true to who you are and being really really clear on who you want to talk to yeah like if you're sharing tips about Instagram but you're doing it in your kitchen pouring your gin that's showing what what you're you're about if you went to the gym to do that maybe that's not quite so authentic (laughs) (laughs) god I would never record anything of me in the gym (laughs) unless I was drinking gin (laughs) I think it's all about it's that that deep connection come it comes from having something in common with people doesn't it so it's not just the business side of things that you have in common with people it's that personality stuff but it's also really understanding the problems that your perfect people are facing we've talked a lot in the past about like the pain points and stuff. But I think sometimes that's really difficult for people to get their heads around. So the way you need to think about it with marketing, people are either looking for something that's going to take away their pain or they're looking for something that's going to bring them pleasure. So for example, if you were a social media manager, your potential client is either pulling their hair out because they don't know what to post. So that's their pain or they want brilliant results from their social, that's their pleasure. So there's two opposite ends of that sort of spectrum of the pain and the pleasure point that you can bring into your messaging. But you really need to understand what that is because not everyone's pain is going to be that they don't know what content to put out. Not everyone's pain is going to be that they're overwhelmed by the changes on social media. You really need to understand what their pain is and what the result is that they want before you can craft your messaging well. Yeah, because and I think there's... A lot of social media managers create content for businesses who have never outsourced before, which is fine if that's their ideal client. But you don't see much content that is trying to appeal to the businesses who already have an agency or a freelancer. Because most of my clients who are slightly bigger, um, like more established businesses, they all had agencies involved when I got my foot in the door and they weren't happy they weren't happy with the results they felt they were missing a trick and they wanted to have a conversation with somebody else to get another point of view get another perspective to to say you know is 
it is what is going out on our social media. Could you do better than that? And obviously I had to then go in and basically tell them that no, it wasn't very good <laughs> and how I could do better. It's not just about getting your foot in the door, is it? It's about how you build that connection from those first conversations right through now to four years down the line. I'm still working on that relationship so I can be clear and confident that they're going to keep me. Like it's yeah, reminding at the beginning them. of that relationship, your content had been talking about like when you first get started outsourcing to a social media manager, they that wouldn't have resonated with them at all because they were already no. using an agency. So that's what it's like coming back to who is that right person and knowing so much as you, you know, as much as you possibly can about them and about yeah. what they're already doing in their business. You're right. That is missed so much. Have conversations with people. If you're at a, a networking event or you happen to be stood on a playground at school with someone else who works in a business where they outsource stuff, just have the conversation. You're not pitching to them. You're just saying, oh, you know, what is it that, why would you be hesitant to outsource? Why is it you go to an agency, not a freelancer? Have these just ask questions. That's yeah. how you're truly going to understand what the situation is with only obviously they've got to be your target audience but being open to listening to what people are saying is going to help you create your content you need to be listening all the time yeah definitely agree I think the second thing that you can do once you kind of know who those people are and I think this is something that we've done a lot in our own business um, but also we've done as freelancers and more freelancers probably need to kind of take a step back and look at this is making that process really easy and really intuitive. So what happens when a lead does actually come your way? Like how does that work in your business? Step by step, what does somebody do when they come into your world? And is it easy for them to is it easy for them to find you in the first place? But once they have found you and they understand they've resonated with your messaging and all of that stuff, is it easy for them to find the information that they want? Do they have to click 100 buttons on your website, for example, to find it? Like, go through that and just look at it from somebody else's perspective on the other side of the screen. How easy is it? Yeah, like, oh, oh, we've, we've talked about this before, but one of my biggest bugbears is when I start a conversation with somebody, I would like to know their name. <laughs> and it sounds stupid, but actually... The amount of social media managers who don't have their name either on their social media or on their website. So if someone wants to start an email, what do they say? Hi, yeah. Hi. social media manager. Hi, Make comma. sure, yeah, it, knowing someone's name gives you the ability to be easily be able to start a conversation, which sounds so simple. But honestly, go have a look at your bios. Go have a look at your website. Do you actually tell people what your name is? Because that is a barrier to starting conversations. It just makes it all a bit more, a bit awkward. And I think as well, this kind of goes from platform to platform. We speak to a lot of people, for example, in Facebook groups. So in Facebook, uh, in, in a group, they might have, they, they probably will usually have their full name. They might have a different surname on Facebook than they have everywhere else. That's fine but they will have a profile picture. So we'll know what they look like. If they then drop into our DMs on Instagram under their business name and the photo's different and it doesn't have their name, how are we meant to know it's the same person? Yeah. So we could be having completely different kind of conversations, not realising it's the same person. And that's really awkward. That I've got into trouble a few times with that. It's awkward. So you need to look at it from the other side of the screen and just make sure that it's really easy. Yeah, you need to do your own audit, really, don't you? 100%. And go through that process because I always like to find somebody on their website, like Google, and then I like to go and check them out on Instagram and I like to go and follow their stories, try to get to know them a little bit more. The biggest 
issue is the links in people's websites yeah. don't work. You can't actually find them on social media or their their web. It, you know, it's like someone now, if someone wanted to come and find Virtually Savvy the web, and they find the website, but then wanted to come and check out my social, if I remove the links, it would be very difficult, which is probably not a bad thing, really, because I don't put any content <laughs> out. But it'd be very difficult for someone to come and find me because my handles are my name not virtually savvy and there is a reason why for that but I think people just need to check don't they can that person find me can that person find everything they want about me my socials my website do all the buttons work are people taken to 404 pages which seems to happen a lot like just take a step back or get someone who is removed from the business to go and check these things for you And they'll be able to see the things, the typos, the broken links. But it's so important because, you know, first impressions do bloody count. Like those social links. Yeah, it's bad if the link doesn't work, but it's equally bad if you're linking them over to a platform that you set up five years ago that you never post on there anymore. Just take that link down. They don't need to go to your Twitter page that you haven't posted on for ages. Yeah. They need to go to the, the pages that are relevant. Yeah. You know, the platforms that you actually manage, the platforms that you actually share content on, the platforms that you want to help them with, they're the ones you need to link to. And yeah. I think, yeah, definitely do or that. They just ne- they've never updated them, and so they just go to Instagram, not yeah. to your actual profile. Yeah, or they've bought a website template and it goes over to the web developer or wherever <laughs> the business that they bought the website template from wix.com <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so definitely yeah d- definitely go and check that but also on your website you have been really transparent in the information that you're giving like so often if i'm going to spend money on myself or on our business and i go onto a website the first thing i want to know is can i actually afford this and if there's no information on there about whether or not i can afford it and i've got to go out of my way to have a conversation with somebody. I am not doing that. Mm. I want to know if I can afford it before I waste my time or somebody else's time. So like you need to be really transparent in all of the information you're giving away. Don't make someone try and fill in the gaps or guess. And yeah, just make it really, really easy. And just remember that not everyone wants to book a call with you. Get in on a call with somebody to find out how much they charge. For me, it's my idea of hell. I don't really like getting on a call anyway. But when it's something like that, it's like, no, thanks. I don't want to do that. Definitely not. So, yeah, go back, check your website, check that everything works, all of the links and everything work. Check that all of your socials say the right things. Your messaging resonates with people. Your name's on your Instagram, all of that stuff. Because that's all like kind of the start of that relationship building isn't it yeah and have a think about if you were looking for somebody like we've just been saying if you're looking to hire somebody yourself or looking to you know find a service that you are interested in what is it that you look for to make you decide whether you want to choose that particular person like what is your process for 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 checking someone and do you go to their website first do you do what I do and go to a website and always click through like have a think about how you operate because the chances are it will probably be very similar to other people and then go and follow that process So we said at the start of this episode that we were going to help you to stop wasting time with people who can't afford your fees. We are going to get to that very soon. So keep listening for that one thing that you can do today. But before we talk about that, we just want to kind of take a step backwards and talk about the bit that comes before that, uh, which is your pre-qualifying process. This is so crucial when it comes to building relationships with potential clients. And as you're listening to this, just ask yourself, Do you actually have a pre-qualifying process in place? And if you're shaking your head going, no, I haven't done this. This is something that I I know I need to do, but I haven't done yet. Or you don't even know what we're talking about. This is so important. If you don't have this in place in your business, make this something that you focus on over the coming months and get it set up. Because this is as much for you as it is for your potential client. This is the thing that will stop you from wasting time. And this is the thing that will start to build trust immediately with potential clients so the reason that you have a pre-qualifying process is because not everyone gets to work with you 
You don't want to work with everybody. You want to work with the perfect people, the people who you have things in common with, the people who you enjoy working on their accounts, the people who are on the right platforms, the people who can afford you. You don't want to work with those clients who have red flags from day one, but you won't know that unless you have pre-qualified them. And so many people miss this part, don't they? Yeah. It's so important to just be able to to have that process in place, A, to not waste time. Like, you know, you're not going to have to put these proposals together with people that actually all the red flags are glaringly obvious because you've gone through this process. But also it's good for them as well. And it, mm. if they actually go, oh, you know what? I don't think I am right for this, but I've kind of maybe enjoyed the process isn't the right word. It means that when they are ready they'll come back, they'll come back to you, or maybe they'll never be ready. But because the process was a good process, they'll, like we've said before, they'll recommend you to other people. So a pre-qualifying system is something that it just, it puts you in a good light, regardless of the outcome. It's a great starting point for you and for the potential clients. Yeah, it makes you look professional as well, doesn't it? And like, so for example, if you only work with clients uh, to manage their Instagram and you're very clear with that in your pre-qualifying and somebody actually doesn't want to be on Instagram, they want to be on LinkedIn, they're going to remember you as the person who manages Instagram, either when they go on Instagram or when their friend says to them, I really need someone to help with my Instagram. They're going to remember you because that was so, such a clear thing that, that you couldn't help them with at that point but they know that you're the expert that you can help other people with. So don't be afraid that this process will put people off. It's designed to put people off. It's meant to put Mm. people off and it will make you look better because then those leads will know that you don't just work with any old Tom, Dick and Harry. You work with brilliant businesses. And how good is it when you qualify yourself and you're like, oh, brilliant, I can work with them. This is great. I'm so excited that I actually have all of the things in place to work with this person. It's like like they passed the test. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And we've been on the other end of this sometimes when we've looked at things that we want to outsource (laughs) or things we want, like, you know, other things we want to do. And we go on their website and we're like, oh, no, you have to be earning X amount of money. We're like, oh, God, I wish. (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, or, you know, you have to have this up in your business. Like, yes, we've got that. Let's let's crack on. It makes yeah. you feel good. So don't be afraid of that for sure. It also really helps them to self-identify. So you don't have to do that for them. They're reading this and they think, yeah, OK, this is me. Or, oh, no, this isn't me. So it kind of it helps their process along. And it helps them, as you just said before, kind of look at their business and acknowledge the things that they need to do. And then once they've done those things, you're going to be the one that they remember because you were the one that told them about it in the first place. Mm. And that's made an impact in their business. They're going to be grateful. So how you actually pre-qualify somebody starts with going back to knowing who it is you want to work with. That is the key yeah. to a successful business, isn't it? <laughs> Bit of a broken record, isn't it, that we spout on about this. But it's so important. If we say we'll work for anyone, then... You can't pre-qualify anyone, can you? No, exactly. So it's kind of like starts with your messaging and then in your like pre-qualifying process, you need to get get rid of the people who are not right. So what do they need to have in place in their business to, to work with you? Do they need to, for example, be on a specific platform? Do they need to have specific assets or a specific budget if you do ads? Uh, what budget do they have to have to actually pay you? All of those sorts of things are really important to, for pre-qualifying. So you need to create a pre-qualifying questionnaire, basically, with all of those important questions. Uh, you could use Typeform or Airtable or something like that. There's loads of free things that you could use to do this. And then that needs to be the thing that's on your website. And then only the people who qualify, having completed that questionnaire, only those people go on to your next step, which is your discovery call. So you're not having calls with every single Tom, Dick and Harry who hasn't pre-qualified them themselves. Yeah. And then if they don't pass the qualification process, they will either get told by you, I'm really sorry, you don't have this, this and this in place. Come back to me when you have. Or you can offer them something else, can't you? Like a power hour or a VIP day or something else that you offer in your business that is more suitable for them. And then 
that means they get to work with you, which is obviously what they wanted to do in the first place. And then once they have got all of those things in place, then they'll be able to come back to you and they will have already had that working relationship with you. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you pre-qualify, like using a questionnaire like that, you, it takes away any awkward conversations that you have yeah. to have with people. Like no one likes talking about money, for example, no. we're, you know, especially in England or Britain, we're very um, awkward about all of that. So it takes it away. Like my pre-qualifier, it says uh, my fees start from a minimum of this and minimum ad spend needs to be this. And basically don't fill out this form if you can't afford me. And so it means that I don't then have to get on a discovery call. The conversation turns to money and then I'm all a bit, oh God, you know, I don't have to be awkward. Whereas when I talk about money now with people on a discovery call, it's fine because I know they already know how much I charge. That That's already out there. And I think that makes such a difference. So sometimes, and it's not just about money, it's other awkward conversations, but that you can kind of navigate around by having this pre-qualifier questionnaire. Yeah, definitely. So If you're multitasking and you've kind of zoned out a little bit, come back to us because this is the nugget that you've been waiting for. This is the thing that you can implement today. And in fact, if you're listening to this at your desk, you can literally do this right now. On your website, if you have a book a call button, take that button off. So many social media managers have a button on their website where somebody can book it. It goes through to Calendly and they can book a call. This is doing you absolutely no favors. It means that Literally anyone can book a call with you and block out 15 minutes or an hour or whatever in your diary. Why would you let people do that if they haven't pre-qualified? Yeah. Take that I think people. Off. I think people worry that they might lose out on opportunities. But, but remember what, what we said earlier. If the first thing we need to do is book a call, we're not going to book a call. No. I hate speaking to people. So yeah. I would love to fill out a form. I'm a yeah. much, much more, and obviously I appreciate you're going to have to have a telephone call at some point. But if you can imagine if I'm a potential client and I go to your website and the first thing I can do to kind of start that process is I have to ring. Oh, God, ring. That sounds like really kind of... God, what are we in 20, the 80s? 2019. <laughs> if we want to go on a Zoom call... Um, <laughs> I'll be like, oh God, no, I don't want that. No, 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 I don't want to do that. But if I, or I don't know when I'm free, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, it, it's just a barrier, isn't it? Whereas yeah. if someone just says, you've just got to fill out this form and I'll get back to you. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a just big a, ask, isn't yeah, it? To yeah. ask somebody to book a call. Yeah. Massive. Especially a stranger. Yeah. And if you think like this person's gone from maybe looking at you on LinkedIn or Instagram to your website they've not really had any conversation anywhere they've not been in your dms or anything and you want them to book a call with you (laughs) that's like really no (laughs) that's a massive ask so yeah you might think that taking that button off of your website is going to stop your leads but actually it's going to stop you wasting time and it's probably going to generate more inquiries Yeah, I agree. It's easier if someone can just fill in a form. Like I get, so I get people fill out my form, even though it does say on my website, I'm at capacity. So don't fill out the form. They still fill out the (laughs) form. I get at least one a week. Yeah. Now, obviously they just all go off to meet the social pro website. I sent them to now, but yeah, I still get them now all the time, but I can guarantee I would not have one or two phone calls a week if that was a book of discovery call. No. I just, I put money on it. And if you if you have people book a call with you and you haven't first pre-qualified that they are right for you, especially in terms of budget, what's going to happen is you're going to get on that call immediately, pretty much you're going to realise that they can't afford you. And you're going to spend 20 minutes giving them basically strategy call, giving away all your knowledge for free when they're never going to turn into a paying client. So it's just such a waste of time. So that is our nugget of the day. Take that button off your website and replace it with a, a link over to a form that they can fill in, a questionnaire for your, your pre-qualifying questionnaire. That will, it will make such a big, big difference in your business, honestly. The next thing that you need to think about when it comes to building connections is to under-promise and over-deliver. I think this is a really big thing in business, isn't it? In any business, but particularly this. In any working 
life. Like I, my dad used to tell me this. It's one of the <laughs> one little nuggets of things that my dad used to, I can't even remember how old I would have been. I don't even know whether I was at work. <laughs> and that was the one thing that he always used to say to me. And it was always his biggest disappointment when people over promise and under deliver so you do have to flip that and it's a, it's like little things like I'll get the proposal to you by Friday but you actually get it to them on Wednesday it's it's just those little things that yeah make people keeping think, people oh, in this, the loop yeah don't, you're just not those keeping, little tiny things yeah yeah it's so important that one should be put on a post-it note and stuck on a monitor <laughs> Definitely. There's loads of things that you can do to under promise and over deliver without actually having to do loads more work. Because this isn't about you delivering loads more free work. No. Be very clear on this. But it might be that you give them a bit of advice that they weren't expecting. Or, you know, you solve a problem that, that you know that they were facing. Anything like that can really make a difference, can't it? Yeah, like I often will say to clients, so oh, I've just noticed this isn't working on your website or I don't think this is quite right just from my perspective and it's just sometimes I don't want to hear it today, but but they're always very like grateful they're like oh thanks for thanks for that or if you spot a typo it's just being helpful isn't it which is yeah, not my totally. remit it's not my remit to spot a typo on a website that's not my scope but I'll, she can't if I spot help... them on our website, but she does it on her clients. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I spot them on your LinkedIn all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about just being helpful and being useful to people. But yeah, not going completely OTT and saying, look, I've spotted this typo. I've rewritten it for you. That was probably a bit <laughs> over yeah, I've the I've just top. logged into the back end of your website and done it all for you. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> It's, that, it's just that you want to be the, the business who gives that really amazing service, don't you? So that you are the one that is unforgettable in a really good yeah. way, obviously, not, not a bad way. So that your clients, like we said, stick with you for a long time, but also tell other people about you. Like that word of mouth is so important, isn't it? This goes back to a previous episode of the podcast I think it was number 31 if you want to go and have a re-listen to that one or a listen if you haven't before but it's all about how you can just think about your reporting in a slightly different way which will help you to retain your clients so again this is about this connection deepening it building that trust and keeping your clients you know there's so much talk about winning clients and onboarding clients but actually you do need a strategy in place to retain those clients so go have a listen to that one number 31 um, because it's a good one about how you can implement that in your business each month and just little little things that you can do as well that will help to build those deeper connections just like surprising your clients you know when you take on a new client maybe send them a little gift or a little handwritten note anything like that anything that makes them feel valued as a client because like yeah you want to be feel valued as their social media manager um so you kind of need to flip it and how can you make them feel valued as part of your business as well i think is is important i'm not saying go out and spend hundreds of pounds on a massive hamper but you know a little handwritten postcard you know, <laughs> i thought you a, said a, a hammer then. 12 <laughs> yeah, don't buy them a hammer don't hamper. buy them a, a hamper of hammers um yeah just send them you know a cadbury's 12 <laughs> I don't have to, have to say I don't send my clients anything but I do send them like Christmas cards and a mm. Christmas gift and 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 I do think it makes a difference like my one client who's been in business for a long long time is like oh my god I've never had anything like this from anyone I've outsourced to which oh, made nice, me think oh my it? god am I wasting my money but I've obviously continued to do think, that oh my god I'm gonna have to do that every year <laughs> yeah like <laughs> exactly <laughs> Okay, so if you found this podcast interesting and useful, but if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've not got half of these things in place, then do check out the Social Media Managers Toolkit where we go into a lot more detail about how you can onboard and win your clients. You can check it out at the thetwolauras.com forward slash toolkit. We'll obviously pop the link in the show notes and do come and ask us any questions. Yeah, we hope this um, episode has been useful. Don't forget that little nugget of going and taking that button off of your website 
not expecting somebody to book a call with you and instead send them to your pre-qualifying questionnaire. You can literally do that in minutes. It's just a quick quick change, if you've, especially if you've, already, if you've already got that questionnaire in place. We would love to know what you're thinking about the podcast. So wherever you're listening, you can go and rate and review. If you're enjoying it, obviously, feel free to leave us five stars. We will very much appreciate that. Um, we read all the reviews. So yeah, leave us a review. We'll definitely love to, to read those as well. Um, and we'll be back next week. We'll see you on Tuesday. We won't see you, but you might hear us. <laughs> Bye. Ta-ra!